Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Gwen Taylor, Senior Editor with Current Protocols at John Wiley & Sons, and I'm here today to introduce a webinar entitled LCMS-Based Metabolomics, Workflows, Strategies, and Challenges. This webinar is being co-sponsored by Current Protocols and Thermo Scientific. Thermo Fisher Scientific is a world leader in serving science, providing analytical technologies, reagents, consumables, services, and software for cutting-edge scientific research to routine industrial applications. Current Protocols is the largest collection of peer-reviewed, authoritative, and regularly updated step-by-step -step research techniques and procedures available for life scientists worldwide. With 17 titles and over 15,000 protocols, Current Protocols is part of Wiley Publishers. We have allotted one hour for today's program, but our speaker has agreed to stay on a bit longer to answer as many of your questions as possible. You can submit your questions throughout the event by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Clary Klisch is the director of the Metabolite Profiling Platform at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard and is an expert in metabolomics. During his postdoctoral fellowship in the laboratory of Dr. Charles Surhan at the Center for Experimental Therapeutics and Reperfusion Injury at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dr. Klisch discovered and characterized a new class of anti-inflammatory lipid mediators that have since been named resolvins and are currently develop, being developed as potential therapeutics. From 2001 to 2004, Dr. Klisch worked for Beyond Genomics where he led comparative metabol metabolite profiling and biomarker discovery programs in cancer, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic disease. From 2004 to 2008, Dr. Klisch was employed by Orr Pharmaceutics, formerly called Gene Logic, where he led programs in indications discovery for drug candidate molecules and oversaw the company's metabolite profiling in silico biology and genomic pharmacology platform technologies. Dr. Klisch joined the Broad Institute in 2008, where his lab develops and applies technologies for the systematic analysis of endogenous metabolites in biological specimens. The lab has active research in several areas of biology, including cancer metabolism, microbial metabolism, and discovery disease signatures in cancer and cardiometabolic disorders. So let's begin with a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Klisch. Uh, thank you, Gwen, for the, uh, the introduction, and, and thank you to uh, Current Protocols for the opportunity to present um, this presentation today. Uh, by way of a, a brief outline, I, I will begin the presentation by doing an introduction to metabolomics and LCMS. I'll then present some challenges to uh, measuring the metabolome and then give an overview of an LCMS metabolomics workflow that includes um, guidelines for sample collection and storage preparation of LCMS samples and LCMS measurements and quality monitoring. Uh, but first, uh, to get started on, on this topic, uh, the question is, what is metabolomics and metabolite profiling? Well, we consider it to be the systematic analysis of endogenous metabolites in biological specimens. It's a relatively new term, uh, but the concept isn't new. Uh, dating back about 4,000 years ago, Chinese doctors used to use ants to detect high levels of glucose in urine as an indicator of diabetes. Uh, in the last 4,000 years, uh, technology has come a, a long way, so we, we do things a little differently today. Our general approach to metabolomics is illustrated here, where we start with biological samples uh, that could include uh, human and animal tissues uh, and fluids, uh, uh, single cellular organisms uh, such as, as yeast, uh, bacteria, also cultured cells, as well as growth media. There you can uh, essentially apply metabolomics to virtually any type of biological sample, but this, this is a fairly decent list here. Uh, we then do analytical profiling, and the key features of an analytical profiling method are that it should be able to measure multiple metabolites, that the signal that you measure is proportional to the metabolite concentration, and that the method is, is precise and robust. One then does statistical and data analyses, and these types of analyses can involves uh, univariate and multivariate statistical correlation analyses and also pathway analyses. In the areas of application for scientific discovery include looking at for signatures of disease and biomarkers, so for example, working with clinical specimens, uh, determining metabolic phenotypes oftentimes using cellular model systems or also animal model systems, 
another application that's actually uh, very good for metabolic profiling is determining drug activity and efficacy. So one can study a pharmacodynamics of, of, of uh, compounds uh, using metabolomics. And then, of course, the discovery of uh, new biological mediators, such as lipid mediators of disease. Since this seminar centers on LCMS, I will be focusing on, on the use of LCMS in, in metabolomics. So liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry uh, is, is composed of two components. One is, of course, liquid chromatography, which is a separation of metabolites and complex mixtures. Uh, in liquid chromatography specifically, the stationary phase is a solid material packed into a column, and the mobile phase is a liquid solvent. And the separation occurs based on the differential affinities of the substances that are loaded onto the column for each of the mobile and stationary phases. So illustrated here, we have a three-component mixture uh, depicted as a, a blue band, a red band, and a green band. And we see that the green band uh, is moving down the column uh, at a faster rate than the blue and red band. So the green band actually has a lower affinity for the stationary phase relative to the red and green bands, and the green, green, or red and, and blue bands. And the green band eludes from the column first. There are many varieties of chromatography that are available. Uh, the first two on the list, which are gas and thin layer uh, chromatographies, don't really apply to LCMS. But the, the two types of chromatographies highlighted in blue, reverse phase chromatography and hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography or hillic chromatography, are often used in LCMS. In reverse phase chromatography, the stationary phase is a nonpolar phase uh, comprised of alkyl groups bonded to silica or polymeric beads, while the mobile phase is a, is a more polar phase uh, consisting usually of water and organic solvent blends. And, and this type of chromatography is best for compounds with hydrophobic groups. Hillic chromatography, on the other hand, is, is opposite. The stationary phase is comprised of polar functional groups, which can interact with polar compounds. And the mobile phase is an, usually an organic solvent water blend uh, as well, but uh, we run it slightly differently. And the types of metabolites that we measure using hillic chromatography are polar analytes. The key thing to remember about chromatography, though, is that the separation really depends on the combination of stationary and mobile phases used. Now, mass spectrometry, on the other hand, is the MS part of LCMS, and we can use it for both separation and measurement of metabolites. Illustrated here is an example of a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. The first, on, on the left-hand slide of the slide, we see the eluent from the LC, LC column, uh, to which a high voltage is applied to create a spray of ionized molecules. And this is a key uh, point for LCMS-based methods that the metabolites that we wish to measure, measure must be able to ionize or at least form an ionic adduct during this electrospray process. This electrospray uh, plume, uh, this uh, plume of ions is sampled by the mass spectrometer, and in this particular type of mass spectrometer that uses three quadrupoles, we use the first quadrupole to select a specific ion. So for in this example, we have a, a red uh, ion, uh, blue, and yellow, and we're selecting the blue ion and passing that through to the second quadrupole, or, or in this case, a collision cell, where we fragment uh, this, this ion into product ions. And then we use the third quadrupole to isolate a particular product ion that is sent to the de detector for, for um, uh, measurement. And this, this uh, type of methodology uh, provides a confidence in the identity because we are able to, we know both the, the mass uh, that's isolated in the first quadrupole and the mass that's isolated in the third quadrupole, not to mention the retention time from the chromatography column, but also by filtering out all of the other ions and specifically monitoring a particular product, we improve our signal to noise. So triple quadrupole mass spec is commonly used in, in LCMS metabolomics. Other mass analyzers are often used as well. So here in the top is a quadrupole time of flight mass spectrometer. Illustrated below is an orbitrap mass spectrometer. The quadrupole time of flight uh, mass spectrometer, I've, I've uh, 
diagrammed a quad, the first quadruple as well as a collision cell. These things are often very similar to the, the triple quad. But in this type of system, we just pass all of the ions through both of both the first the quadruple as well as the collision cell to the time of flight analyzer. And the way this works is that the ions arrive as a packet to this plate called a pusher, which then accelerates um, the, the ions on a path down the tube, which is reflected back towards the detector. And the metabolites that are the smallest reach the detector first, while those that are larger uh, reach it at some point uh, afterward. And this is a highly reproducible and precise event. So this, this type of instrument can measure masses with a high degree of mass resolution. The Orbi trap is a uh, technology that's exclusive to Thermo Fisher Scientific, and it works on a different principle. Uh, essentially, the ions are emitted from its electrospray source, they travel through a path to a um, device called a C-trap, and then they're injected into uh, um, the Orbi trap mass analyzer, where they go into a, a resonant um, uh, orbit uh, around the central electrode, and, and the rate of that, that movement around the electrode is highly uh, precise and can be measured very precisely. Um, so the key features of quadruple time of flight and orbit trap data are that um, they're both high resolution. The orbit trap, current orbit traps have higher resolution than the, the best QTOFs currently, and the resolution of the mass data is much, much greater than on a triple quad. They also both have the feature of being able to acquire the data very quickly, which is helpful if you have narrow peaks and you need to get many points across the peak. On the downside, though, these types of instruments are not as sensitive as the best triple quad instruments. Um, nevertheless, they are superior for non-targeted analyses, which I'll describe shortly. So depicted here in this slide is basically what an LCMS chromatic Gram looks like for plasma extract, in this particular case using a hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography. And the key features of the chromatogram really are that the metabolite peaks are separated over time and that uh, we do have some peaks that are uh, co-eluting, but because we're using a mass spectrometer where we were able to d determine uh, the different masses of the the, um, these metabolites, they're actually separated by mass. So we have this the advantage of using LCMS is that we have we can separate the metabolites in the time dimension in terms of chromatography, but then we also are able to separate them based on mass. Okay, but uh, it does our, our desire to measure the complete metabolome does present certain challenges. And the first really has to do with differences in physical properties among metabolites. So for example, in this diagram here, we have a list of metabolites. It's not 100% comprehensive, but it starts with triglycerides, which are very nonpolar, and goes down to uh, metabolites such as organic acids and sugars, which are very polar. Um, and because of these differences in polarity, we actually can't separate all of these metabolites with a single chromatography method. So if you wish to do metabolomics on this variety of metabolites, you really need to consider using multiple methods. So uh, one strategy we've used is to use a combination of reverse phase chromatography and hydrophilic interaction chromatography. So we use a, a nonpolar uh, stationary phase to separate our lipids and then even uh, a, a, separate, uh, a stationary phase that has a greater degree of nonpolarity, a C18 column, to separate metabolites of intermediate uh, polarity. And then for the very polar metabolites, we typically use hillock chromatography to se separate those metabolites. So clearly we're running at least uh, three methods. Uh, further, as I mentioned before, that all metabolites, in order to measure the metabolites using mass spectrometer, they must, anal they must ionize. Some metabolites tend to form positively charged ions more readily, others negatively charged ions. So we end up having to use, perhaps even with the same method, measurements in both the positive ion mode but also the negative ion mode. So um, it, it's a complex uh, situation. Now, uh, one thing that is very powerful about LCMS is that with a single method, uh, we can measure tens to hundreds of metabolites, and we can do so over four orders of magnitude dynamic range of, of concentration, which is it, which is very impressive and, and 
um, uh, you know, suggests that the uh, the technologies should be well suited for measuring of com components of the metabolome. However, uh, metabolite endogenous concentrations of metabolites, of course, occur over a wide dynamic range of concentrations, really theoretically down to as few as one molecule per cell to uh, millimolar concentrations. And because we're sampling only about four orders of magnitude linear dynamic range with any particular method, a, a single analysis can't provide full coverage. So that is one limitation of, of LCMS-based methods. Second, um, I'd like to illustrate here the, the relationship between the biomass of sample that one has available, the metabolite coverage that you wish to, to measure, and the impact of technology. So on this plot, um, I've just sketched here that if we consider endogenous concentrations, which can range from low to high concentration, as well as the, the amount of biomass or the amount the sample size uh, that you must have, in order to do the work, as well as the effort um, th that is required to work up the sample for LCMS. You can see that for compounds that have high endogenous concentrations, we tend to need less, less biomass and less effort to measure, in this case, a wider range of metabolites. So the shape of this, this uh, uh, um, polygon, um, the, the width on the y-axis indicates the uh, metabolite coverage. Whereas for metabolites that are very low concentration, we tend to require more biomass and more sample workup effort in order to, to make those measurements. And, and typically, when we do so, we're selecting only a certain number of, of metabolites, so really the coverage isn't, isn't particularly uh, wide. However, uh, technology makes a, plays a major role here, makes a major impact on the shape of this curve by, in this case, just increasing the sensitivity of an instrument, say, by about 50%. It really shifts the curve so that at, we can detect metabolites at, at a uh, lower concentration and use less biomass and potentially less sample workup. So one of the um, things to keep in mind with um, liquid chromatography, tandem bass spectrometry-based metabolomics methods is that um, they're really highly dependent on the, the, the um, type of instrumentation that's available at the time. Of course, we can develop a standard operating procedure and set it up on a particular instrument and run it for, for many years. However, uh, with biological samples that are very precious, uh, we, we're constantly evaluating how we can improve our sensitivity and reduce the amount of biomass that we need to use. A third challenge is well, it's not so much a challenge, but it's sort of at least a decision point, and that's choosing between doing targeted versus non-targeted metabolomics. So targeted profiling, again, is typically done using a triple quadrupole mass spec uh, instrument. And in this particular case, you have to specify lists of metabolites because you tune each of these metabolites and, and essentially uh, tune in the, the masses that are isolated in the first quadrupole, how much energy is used to fragment them, and, and uh, the mass of the product ion that you wish to measure uh, at the end. And the reason why one might choose targeted profiling is that the, you have optimal sensitivity with these methods, and also the metabolite IDs are known since you've tuned the molecules in. So uh, in terms of designing an experiment and getting data out on the other end, you know what to expect. And, um, uh, and compared to, uh, not to get too far ahead of myself, non-targeted profiling, metabolite identification can be, can be a bit challenging. The downside of doing uh, targeted profiling is that really your results are only limited to the list of metabolites you specified, and that you don't, you will not collect data on, on novel compounds typically. On the, in contrast, targeted and non-targeted profiling, which is also re, uh, referred to as untargeted profiling or discovery profiling or global profiling, um, in this type of um, scenario, your goal is to measure all metabolite signals. You typically use full scan mass spectrometry, and again, the types of instrumentation that are, are uh, very good uh, uh, good for this are QTOF mass spectrometers, Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometers, which I didn't describe, but which are high resolution mass spectrometers, and Orbitrap mass spectrometers. Uh, and again, in this particular case, by doing full scan mass spectrometry, we measure a wide range of masses. Uh, we don't tune for specific um, mass to charge ratios, uh, and this enables serendipity and broader metabolite coverage. Um, 
However, because these instruments are less sensitive than tri triple quads, the analyses are obviously less sensitive, and you may miss lower abundance metabolites. The other thing is that in order to run these types of methods, you really need to use um, automatic uh, data processing software that can process the many thousands of LCMS peaks that can be measured in a non-targeted way. So you need to have a careful QC uh, protocol to, to check uh, the quality of the automatically processed data. So for example, one might choose uh, sentinel metabolites, perhaps some that are easily processed, but others that are maybe uh, are known to present some challenges for the automatic processing routine with your particular um, uh, chromatography method. And then to check those to make sure that the processing software is, has, has done a good job. And then the last point here that I mentioned briefly uh, was that in, we're measuring, in this case, uh, components, and initially they were known by their uh, retention time coordinates, the time uh, the time at which they emerged from the column, but then also the, their mass-to-charge ratio measured with the mass spectrometer. But we don't necessarily have an ID for that particular component. So the one then, if one finds that that particular signal is significant in, in your study, um, you need to go back and, and attempt to identify that metabolite. So that can be challenging, and, and the success rates range somewhere from 50 to 75 percent in that effort. So to uh, sum up and just give you an illustration of a metabolomics platform, um, we've, this is a, a diagram of the platform we set up at the Broad Institute where uh, we start out with the biological samples like I showed in the intro slide, and then we need to aliquot it for several methods. And then we have specific sample preparation procedures, chromatography procedures, and then uh, different mass spectrometry systems. So I'll just walk you through this. So for example, if we're doing a plasma uh, uh, project, we may start out with a 100 microliter uh, sample of plasma. We would make uh, four aliquots of that plasma, a 10 microliter aliquot for our mean and cationic um, um, measurements, um, a 30 microliter aliquot to measure central metabolites such as sugars, organic acids, and so on, a 10 microliter aliquot to measure lipids, and a, a 30 microliter aliquot for our free fatty acid and bile acid. We have specific sample preparation procedures that we would apply to each of those samples that are matched to the chromatography methods that we would use. So for example, to do polar metabolites under positive ion mode uh, detection, we extract those using a blend of methanol and acetonitrile. Uh, for uh, central metabolites, we use 80% methanol. For lipids, we use uh, 19 to 1 isopropanol. Uh, to do the extraction from plasma. And then for free fatty acids and bile acids, we use we add um, 3 to 1 methanol uh, to those extracts. The chromatography modalities that we're currently using are uh, hillock chromatography uh, using a Waters Atlantis column in the positive ion mode uh, to separate amines and cationic metabolites. So these are metabolites such as amino acids and acyl carnitines. Uh, to measure central metabolites, we use another type of hillock column, a uh, phenomenix NH2 column, uh, in which were under, alluded under basic conditions and measure the metabolites in the negative ion mode. For lipids, I mentioned before, we're using reverse phase chromatography in the C4 column with positive ion mode detection. And then for these compounds of intermediate polarity, we use reverse phase chromatography, the C18 column, and our detection here is in the negative ion mode. Now, over time, we built the platform to be able to do targeted uh, analyses using several triple quadruple instruments. And again, we can measure hundreds of metabolites of known ID. And we can also use these, um, these methodologies to focus on subsets of metabolites in validation studies. Uh, we also have a non-targeted platform uh, comprised of three Orbi trap instruments running the same methods that we use for discovery, metabolic tracer, and, and flux measurement. Okay. Now, as an example of a workflow, this is I'm illustrating here our general workflow, and um, we start with study design uh, and, of course, study approval. But today, I'm going to really focus on um, these features of the workflow, which are um, sample collection, sample storage and shipment, sample preparation, and LCMS analyses, as well as some QC that, that we do. So to begin with, um, 
begin with sample collection. Uh, so basically, for clinical samples, uh, which are, consist generally of body fluids and tissues, our goal is to reduce the time between sample collection and freezing. And the idea there is to uh, preserve the integrity of the metabolites in the sample. So for example, with, for plasma, ideally what one might do is collect the whole blood and centrifuge it within 30 minutes of collection, then collect the plasma and snap freeze it uh, under liquid nitrogen or perhaps even on a tray of dry ice, and then store the samples at, at minus 80 degrees Celsius as soon as possible. Uh, for reference, um, there are good SOPs available on, on the web from uh, this NCI uh, website here, uh, and they're given for urine, serum, and plasma. And though I'm saying that these are the idea, this is the ideal way to process plasma, to quickly um, have it centrifuged and separated uh, and then uh, frozen right away, it doesn't mean that one can't use samples collected in other ways. So, for example, there are clinical studies and, and multiple clinical studies where samples are collected at a remote site uh, on heparin or EDTA and then shipped within 24 hours to a central facility where they're centrifuged and then the plasma is frozen. Uh, there are metabolites that do change as a function of that delay in processing, but one still can use those samples for discovery experiments, and we certainly have as well. I just mean to um, drive the point that if one has the opportunity to design a new study, it, 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 it is advantageous for metabolomics if one can shorten that processing time. Um, cell culture uh, samples are, are different, uh, obviously, than plasma, and what we found is that the protocols generally need some degree of customization. They should be matched to the experimental protocol. So. Uh, if we're doing the metabolomics, we, we certainly want to um, use conditions for cell growth that are um, similar to those that were used for other aspects of the experiment. So we tend to try to uh, uh, modify our, our uh, metabolite profiling sample preparation protocols to, to match the biology. Uh, the, the, you also have to consider the growth characteristics of, of, the, of the cell culture. So our preparation, preparation of uh, samples from adherent cells versus suspension culture are different. And then you also need to account for cell number and size. And to illustrate that, uh, we, we do need to often consider scaling adherent cell cultures. So cells that are commonly grown in 10 centimeter dishes, six wall plates, and 96 wall plates. And for typical um, cell, one might uh, find that there are be able to grow somewhere between two and five million cells in a 10 centimeter dish, uh, perhaps 250,000 to 600,000 cells in a six wall plate, or um, 8,000, or you know, perhaps higher than 20,000, but you know, let's say 8,000 to 20,000 cells in a 96 wall plate. The volume of extraction solvent that's used is really uh, somewhat dictated by the the, the actual size of of the um, of the the culture uh, vessel. So, in a six well, if one's using a 10 centimeter dish, you need to use about four milliliters of solvent to actually extract the metabolites. Whereas you can use 800 microliters to cover the bottom of the plate in the six well plate, and one could use 100 to 150 microliters of solvent in a 96 well plate. One, if you, one does use these volumes, and we take the average number of, uh, of cells estimated here, actually I think max, uh, the number of cell equivalents per microliter in the 10 centimeter extract is 1,200, or, um, 1250. In the six wall plate, about 750 cells per microliter, and, and only about 200 cells per microliter in the 96 wall plate. In our experience, when we've gone to do direct analyses of these extracts, we've been successful at, at doing direct analyses on, on these extracts from 10 centimeter plates and from six well plates. But this ratio of biomass to, um, to solvent extraction volume is too low, only 200 cells per microliter equivalent. And in this particular case, we find that we have to actually pool wells together, collect the solvent, and dry it down. And, to, and concentrate those samples for analyses. Next, I'll move to sample st shipment and storage. And just briefly, um, most samples should just be stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius or colder. 
body fluids and tissues can be kept as intact samples, meaning um, if you have a, a fluid such as plasma, you don't really need to work it up. You can just store it as plasma. If you have a tissue, uh, one can collect the, a tissue sample and then uh, put it in a, a cryovial, uh, or at least a minus 80 C uh, combat compatible uh, storage vessel, and then place that into the freezer. Um, if one does have the opportunity to prepare specific aliquots of plasma before uh, the sample is frozen, th that's a good idea. So that can conserve, or that can uh, that can enable one to avoid a freeze thaw cycle. Uh, with respect to cell extracts, they're a little bit more tricky. Uh, for if you're able to do the analyses uh, if pretty much right away or within a you know a few days. Uh, so for short-term storage, one can store these as extracts in solution. For long-term storage, uh, their cell extracts are commonly evaporated and then stored as dried material. And with respect to shipment, I think this applies to m any biological sample that typically will ship them on dry ice overnight. And then if you're using a courier, of course, we usually schedule our pickups for Monday or Tuesday and, and avoid taking the risk of having um, a, a sample sit on a loading dock over the weekend. For sample preparation for LCMS, we have a variety of different methods that one might use. The key features of a good protocol for sample preparation are listed here, um, I th and the order of these, uh, one might prioritize the order differently. This isn't in order of priority, but the key a protocol should use the biological sample efficiently. Uh, many of the samples we work with, particularly clinical samples, uh, are very, very precious and, and uh, uh, volumes are not great. Uh, this, the protocol should generate samples in which the metabolic concentrations fall within the linear response of the actual analytical method, which should go without saying, but, but that's important. And the final, the final sample solvent composition should be matched to the chromatography method. And this is really important because, uh, for example, in a, if we're using hillock chromatography, we do not want to have the sample uh, in water, we don't want our sample uh, preparation procedure to generate an aqueous sample because um, an aqueous sample introduced to a hilla column will cause the metabolites to load on a, as a kind of a broad band, and then that compromises chromatography. So, someone you should really carefully pair your sample preparation method to the chromatography method. Uh, the sample preparation procedure should preserve the integrity of the metabolites, um, and Ideally, we try to make methods that have as few steps as possible to minimize variance. And last, uh, the procedure should introduce internal standards so to, to enable monitoring of recoveries during the sample preparation procedure and also to uh, allow one to evaluate the analytical variance in the measurements. Internal standards are generally non-biological small molecules or synthetic stable isotope labeled metabolites. So they're just essentially uh, small molecules that are not endogenous to the sample. And I'll go over a few different methods that we use for sample preparation. Protein precipitation is the one that we most commonly use in our lab. And in general, what one does is you take an accurately measured volume of organic solvent containing one or more internal standards and add that to an accurately measured amount of the biological sample. So if it's a body fluid, one might measure out a specific volume like 10 microliters of plasma. If it's a uh, tissue extract, you may um, measure out an accurately weighed amount of tissue or a, um, an accurately measured volume of a tissue homogenous. One allows the proteins to precipitate sometimes in the freezer, sometimes on the bench top. It really depends on the method and the metabolites. Uh, then centrifuge the sample and collect the supernatant, and then ideally analyze the supernatant directly if one can. Uh, sometimes a concentration step can be added if it's necessary. And the key features of doing this simple procedure are that it's, it's, pr it's generally pretty precise because you only have two measurement steps, and that induces little variance. Um, the samples are generally an organic solvent here, so they're ideal for hillock type of methods, which we use for at least um, all the polar metabolites. Um, and this is a higher throughput, uh, probably the highest throughput sample preparation method one could use, and it's, it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the limitation is that we dilute the samples. By definition, we're at increasing the volume of the samples. Uh, there isn't 
uh, significant selectivity. Essentially, we're just uh, crashing out proteins and, and um, generating an aqueous um, organic solvent blend. And then if one is doing reverse phase chromatography, there is a, a, a downside to using this type of methodology because then the samples are an organic solvent, which uh, actually causes the metabolites to load on a broader band in reverse phase chromatography. Another procedure is to use liquid-liquid extraction. This is commonly, so essentially you do a phase separation using two immiscible solvents. This is typically used for lipids. Um, and the classic protocols were uh, from Bly and Dyer back in 1959 and Fultz uh, in 1957. Um, in this type, in, in they, both of these protocols use uh, ratios of chloroform, methanol, and water to do the separation. Uh, the key thing is that polar metabolites and lipids uh, can be uh, separated from one sample. So the uh, lower phase, which in this case is a chloroform phase, contains the lipid components. The upper phase, which is more aqueous, tends to contain the polar metabolites. And uh, because you have this separation of metabolites, it's potentially superior um, to uh, protein precip precipitation. However, um, there are some limitations. So one is that there, there are metabolites that will occur at the interface of the two solvents, the, the two miscible solvents. And those metabolites are missed. The second thing is these types of solvents, particularly chloroform, are not compatible with all plastics. So for practical use in a lab, say doing uh, cell culture on typical 96-well or uh, well 96-well plates, but also 10-centimeter dishes, one one can't uh, generally extract uh, using chloroform from those plastics. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, in terms of the actual procedure. Uh, additional care is required when you pipette the sample. One has to very carefully take off the top layer or take off the bottom layer um, and, and watch what one is doing. So, so it takes a little bit more care and, and precision than, than the former method. A third uh, strategy is to do solid phase extraction. And this is really used for doing, uh, looking at specific classes of metabolites. For example, if one is interested in looking at eicosanoids and lipid mediators, uh, what you do here is essentially a, a step of separation before you do your LCMS. You load the samples onto a solid matrix and selectively elute it. So, for example, we start with a blank cartridge and you condition it. You have a complex sample that you load onto the cartridge. Some metabolites, these ones uh, um, colored yellow, just wash right through. You then do a washing step where you elute some of the weaker binding uh, uh, materials, so these green interferences here. And then do a, an elution step using hopefully a solvent with selective elution for the metabolites of interest, in this case, these red metabolites that are washed through. So this can significantly reduce interferences and, and does enable analyses of low abundance metabolites. And it can, uh, it, it, uh, it can actually clean up the sample, so it spares your LCMS instrument from some of the interferences and impurities that may be in the original sample. So uh, one can improve the overall robustness of the method by doing this type of uh, pre-processing of the samples. Uh, there are a number of limitations, however. So the first is that it's a low throughput method. Uh, by definition, really, it does narrow the range of metabolites. The cost of the cartridge is higher. And because you're doing a, a fairly, you know, a series of steps here, there's a um, greater chance for induce, uh, adding variance to the overall uh, process. So they do have greater variance. And the recoveries are seldom 100% from, from these methods. Last, uh, look at tissue homogenization. There are many options for doing tissue homogenization from taking a tissue and just freezing it and pulverizing it using uh, a hammer or uh, a mortar and pestle. You can use a probe sonicator, fo focused acoustic waves. Um, and there is an instrument from a company called Covaris that can do this or bee beating. So we have many different options. Some of these uh, options can be done as one sample at a time, at a time so a single uh, manual uh, hand homogenizer, or a bead homogenizer here, which can hold up to, um, in this particular case, this is a tissue lyser from uh, Kyogen, and it can hold two plates of, of, I believe, 48 samples in each, each and uh, the samples can be placed into 1.5 milliliter tubes, and it uses... 
uh, stainless steel tungsten carbide or glass beads to, to um, do the sample disruption. Uh, so one has many different options, and of course there are, I didn't I didn't list them all here, but I'm providing an example of an approach that we've used uh, well, where we start with um, somewhere between 25 and 50 milligrams of tissue. We accurately weigh that quantity, and then we add four volumes of water, so one microliter of water per per or sorry four microliters of water water per milligram of tissue. We then homogenize the sample for a fixed amount of time. So this is important to uh, uh, make sure that all samples are treated exactly the same way during the homogenization step. And then we take that aqueous homogenate and then make specifically uh, or uh, precisely measured aliquots from that homogenate for each of our methods. So we use a fixed volume. And then we may store or extract those aliquots directly. So again, um, just to remind you of our, our protocol um, here, we've, we're using four different methods to do the analyses and uh, in our particular platform. And um, I'm just showing again here how we would um, process a body fluid homogenate or a media sample. Um, so for example, uh, as I mentioned actually before, with lipids, we have an isopropanol extract. Uh, where we take 10 microliters of either the body fluid or the homogenate or media, this is growth media, uh, and we add 190 microliters of isopropanol. Uh, for free fatty acids and bile acids, we add 30 microliters, we have 30 microliters of the, the sample, and we add uh, 90 microliters of methanol. For nitrogenous compounds like amino acids, we would take 10 microliters of plasma or or uh, homogenate and add 90 microliters of 75% acetonitrile, 25% methanol. And then for central metabolites, we use a 30 microliter sample and add 120 microliters of 80% methanol. In all cases, we allow time for uh, precipitation of the proteins. And then we, we use a multi-tube vortexer, just like the one illustrated here, uh, to do some uh, shaking. We centrifuge the samples and then we transfer those supernatants to autosampler vials for analyses. Now I'll move on to how we do the LCMS analyses and, and QC. Uh, a typical LCMS method in, in our lab and in many others, uh, typically they're not uh, particularly high throughput methods. Uh, the range of time uh, uh, from start to finish for each method is 10 to 45 minutes per analysis. And that time is comprised of an elution phase uh, where you've, in, you've initiated this by injecting the sample here and the metabolite peaks elute from the column and that's the time at which you're doing measurement. You have to take some time to wash the column, to clean it, and then you have to re-equilibrate the column. So with our methods, we spend a fair amount of time washing and re-equilibrating and that, that helps uh, to improve the overall robustness of the method and allows us to do large sample size queues. So it does slow down the overall uh, methodology, but it, it tends to preserve the precision and, and uh, of, of the measurement in general. Uh, for sample queue sizes, it really depends on how robust your method is. Um, in our methods, uh, so we tend to, um, you know, it, we analyze typically about 40 samples a day with a 30, Five minute method, for example. Um, <clears throat> our methods, uh, in terms of our column lifetimes, we get 250 to 1,000 injections per column. So the column of which we only have 250 injections is the uh, Luna NH2 column we use for central metabolite analyses. That, that chromatography is done at pH 10 in the column. Um, Really, we right under our conditions, we we really only use it for about 250 injections. Whereas our columns that we use for lipid analysis, we can easily get a thousand injections on those. Um, our samples are processed in batches, and we generally do 50 to 150 samples per batch. So somewhere from a day's worth to maybe three days worth of, of samples on the instrument. And th this size of batched process is also something that a person uh, can do in the lab and, and uh, uh, do so precisely. It's not terribly taxing on an individual to manually process that number of samples. So we try to, to design uh, the batches so that um, they can be done reproducibly. 
the cue uh, in our, our lab is often paused uh, to clean the mass spectrometer, and that really depends on, on the method. Um, usually, we'll clean the instruments uh, just at least the front of the, the, the uh, machine where the, just um, the point in the electrospray source uh, once a week or at least every, every two weeks. Uh, one of the things that we do monitor uh, to let us know when the instrument is getting a little dirty is that we take a look at the internal standard signals, which theoretically should be a flat response during the course of the run. And if we see a, a deviation, uh, for example, if the internal standard signals start to drop, uh, we know that's a good time to pause the queue and clean the instrument and then afterwards check to make sure everything is working fine and then restart the machine. We also use reference samples during the queue, and I'll describe um, these reference samples shortly. Uh, also, when we do the LCMS analyses, we tend to randomize our samples. Because there can be these drifts uh, in performance of the, the machine over time, uh, in, uh, in order to avoid uh, introducing a bias based on uh, uh, the instrument performance to the experiment, we randomize the samples. Um, and then last, uh, in or before we do any chromatography on our LCMS systems, we, we analyze reference samples. We analyze them at, before we run do the runs, and we also analyze them periodically during the runs as well as after the runs. And these ran reference samples are synthetic mixtures of, of compounds. We have uh, mixtures of for our targeted methods of up to 150 metabolites that we prepared, or pooled samples. So if you're measuring plasma, it's, it's, uh, you, one can uh, use a pooled plasma sample as a reference. Uh, you can prepare a large pool of plasma, aliquot it, keep it in the freezer, and then work it up with each um, set of samples. And then you actually have a nice sample that you can use to, to gauge the performance of your machine of, over time. I'm going to show an example of applications of some methods. The first is this hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography method. Um, and again, uh, in this method, it's, uh, uh, we have two mobile phases. Uh, we have the first mobile phase A is an aqueous solution of 10 millimolar ammonium formate and 0.1% formic acid. The mobile phase B is acetonitrile containing 0.1% formic acid. And the column is a 150 by 2 millimeter Atlantis hillock column. Uh, the samples were uh, um, um, extracted in uh, in 75%, we take 10 microliters, sorry, of sample, and we extract that with 75% acetonitrile, 25% methanol. That contains a 0.2% formic acid and stable isotope labeled internal standards. So when we add 90 microliters of the extraction solvent to the 10 microliters of samples, these are the final uh, proportions of, of water, acetonitrile, methanol, and formic acid in the sample. And the example I'm going to show is data that were acquired in a targeted analysis using a 4,000 QTRAP mass spectrometer. Um, before I do that, though, i just review one thing with respect to the uh, hillock chromatography. Hillock chromatography um, is different than reverse phase chromatography in, in that your initial conditions, in this case, um, are high, highly organic. So again, we're starting out with 95% solvent B, which is acetonitrile. And then we, um, <clears throat> so if we start out here, this is this line in red is uh, solvent B. We start out with high percent B, and it actually goes down as a function of time. In reverse phase, it's the opposite. All right. So in this particular example, I just want to show the, how um, how the, the the method performed that uh, method performed uh, when we looked at about 750 plasma samples. In this experiment, we measured um, uh, the samples in five batches of 150 samples, and we added an internal standard um, to every sample. And here we'd like to take a look at the internal standard performance, both within the batch and across the five batches. Shown here is a plot of the measured value of valine D8, the internal standard, in a batch of about 150 samples. This was the fifth of five batches, so this is after five weeks of continuous runtime, and we see some variance uh, in the sample. It starts at a little higher here, and it, it ticks down a little bit as time goes on. Um, I 
should mention here too that when we add internal standards, uh, we use uh, concentrations of internal standards that are below the endogenous concentration of the corresponding metabolites. So for example, this valine D8 is a deuterated valine, um, but the, the quantity that we've added is uh, the signal intensity of this quantity is lower than the typical endogenous valine signal. We do that because we don't want to interfere with the endogenous metabolite signal. Um, in the build here, we see this plot below where I plotted, I've taken the mean of the, the coefficients of, I've taken the uh, uh, mean of the coefficient of variation for this batch, uh, and uh, for example, this plot plotted right here, uh, sorry, this is the mean value of, of, of the signal for this batch, and this is the standard deviation. And what we see is that the mean value dropped during the five weeks of analysis. So we had a, we had a loss of signal as this data as these data were acquired over five five weeks, and this clearly was due to drift in instrument sensitivity over time, and would really require us to normalize the data to the internal standard signal. And what we learned from doing this experiment, and this was, this was something that we did uh, approximately about f uh, four years ago. Uh, was that we needed to uh, clean the instrument more frequently. So by cl cleaning the instrument after perhaps each batch or after each week, we can return these points back up to um, uh, the starting value. All right. Now for quantitation, it's an important thing to, to point out that the raw LCMS data are really unitless peak area values. Okay, so they're not concentration units. You can tra transform them to concentration units by using calibration curves one for each specific metabolite, or by calculating ratios relative to, relative to reference standards in, in the sample using a single concentration point, which is uh, not, not quite as uh, good as using a calibration curve, obviously, because every metabolite may have its own saturation characteristics. One of the challenges, though, to doing this absolute concentration, meaning to convert peak areas into concentration units, is that we don't have reference standards for every metabolite. And also, the cost of running, if we have a method, say even the targeted method that measures 100 metabolites, we need to measure 100 calibration curves. Uh, so that, that effort takes time and, and, and uh, uh, financial resources to do. So our lab really does mainly relative quantitation, meaning we take the, the, use the raw C LCMS data. And it works very well for projects uh, completed in a single period, uh, meaning it's one batch. Um, the measured values on the instrument can change over time, as I showed before, uh, due to changes in the MS detector. So, you know, we have to mitigate mitigate that drift in machine performance. I mentioned that for longer batches, we'll clean the machine more frequently, but there are other ways to address instrument sensitivity across batches. And one way we found that works pretty well is to use pooled plasma reference samples or pooled reference samples. Uh, for standardization. So what one does here is you generate a reference sample that is the same type as the study sample. So for body fluids, we'll take a, a, a pooled sample, a pool of urine, a pool of plasma, make several milliliters, and then aliquot that pooled sample so we can analyze it uh, during the runs. Or for cell extracts, what we've done is we take, we'd pool cell extracts from several cell, uh, either several batches of cells, or if it's a, an experiment where we're looking at different cell lines, we'll take a pool of, of, of um, extracts from different cell lines. We then um, aliquot that and then dry the samples down for future use. Okay. And then what one does is one then takes these reference samples, either the body fluid or cell extract samples, and then you introduce the samples into the analysis, al analysis queue after about every 10 or 20 standard uh, study samples. And then at the end, conclusion of, of the experiment, once you have all of the data, then you can normalize the data relative to the, to, relative to the nearest pooled plasma or pooled uh, reference sample. And one can do so simply by taking the peak area of the study sample and then dividing that by the area of the nearest pool, pooled reference sample. And if one, one of the downsides of just calculating this ratio is that you lose the differences in relative intensities. So it is possible then to just uh, multiply this ratio back by, say, the mean value for the pooled reference samples in the study. And then, then you get back the relative um, signal intensity information that way. Um, <clears throat> also, if one needs to go back and do 
a quantitation, or at least make an approximation of the quantity, uh, the absolute concentration of a metabolite in, in the run. One can then simply uh, uh, perform quantitation on the pooled ref on the reference sample at some later point using a calibration curve. And because you have the area, uh, these relative peak areas calculated for every single metabolite, one can then just make a, a pretty good estimate, at least based on a single uh, concentration point as to the uh, concentration of that particular metabolite. We can also use these pooled reference samples to assess the overall quality. And this is an actual example of a more recent study where we have had uh, a clinical study of 865 plasma samples. And we've, in this particular case, because we've introduced pooled reference samples, uh, the number of samples we worked with was 900. 950, and we performed uh, QA and QC on these samples in the following way. We, in this, this project, uh, we had reference mixtures that were analyzed before and after study samples to assure system performance. Uh, then we had internal standards that were added during the first step in the extraction. These were monitored during the analyses and were also uh, available to be used to normalize the data. Then we introduced two sets of pooled samples. One was pooled study samples that we ana analyzed after every 20 uh, study samples. These are used to normalize across data sets. So this is a part of a larger clinical study where we do need to normalize the batches, as I described in the previous slide. And then the second pool plasma sample was used uh, and analyzed after every 20 samples. And we used it to uh, assess the overall reproducibility as well as the impact of any normalization procedures that we've done. So this is how the queue looked. We had a, a one pool plasma sample from the study and then a re pooled plasma reference sample, 20 study samples, and then the pooled samples again and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the method that we used to measure these was a lipid profiling method here. Um, the mobile phase in this method is uh, 95% um, aqueous solvent containing 10 millimolar uh, uh, ammonium acetate with 5% uh, uh, methanol. Mobile phase B is essentially methanol containing acetic acid, and we're using C4 chromatography to do the separation. The samples were extracted with 19 volumes of isopropanol containing an internal standard, and we analyzed the data using full scan analysis and an Orbitrat mass spectrometer. And I'm plotting here uh, the raw data and the normalized data, but essentially just the coefficients of variation for the data. So the coefficient of variation is calculated by taking the standard deviation uh, and dividing that by the mean, and really just looking at the CVs for 135 identified lipids in the ref reference pool plasma samples. So we had 43 pool plasma samples that were analyzed during the course of the experiment of Essentially, as I mentioned before, we had about nearly a thousand samples. It took about a four four weeks to acquire the data, and what we see here is that the compounds, the lipids that have the highest coefficients of variation, are the those that have the weakest signals, whereas those lipids that um, have higher uh, peak areas or stronger uh, signals tend to have lower coefficients of variation. That's a fairly typical thing that you see with LCMF meth methods that. The shape of this curve goes like, kind of like this. Um, and in the raw data, uh, approximately 10% of these 133 identified lipids had CVs of less than 71%. And that's over a four-week uh, four period. So that was actually very good. Certainly, 96% uh, uh, of these lipids had CVs under 20%. We did normalize the data to just the internal standard, and that actually improved the CVs uh, for certain metabolites, we had a certain subset that a drop below, that uh, uh, went down below 5% CV, and and uh, but in, in general, this was actually a pretty decent data set. But this is how we evaluate it. We'll tend to take a look at the coefficients of variation, and then we try to check the impact of normalization. And the only way we were able to do this was by including that second pooled uh, pooled uh, plasma reference sample.
This is how the data actually looked. So this, this is the plot of an endogenous metabolite, in this case it's C160 lysophosphatidylcholine, and plotted across here are the 43 pooled plasma samples that were run over four, uh, about a four week period. And we see that we started out fairly flat, there was a little drop, and then it started, the signal started to go up, which is kind of interesting. And then you see a break here, and then it starts again. And the reason for the break is that we saw that change, and then we cleaned a component of the mass spectrometer at that point, and in doing so, um, uh, the, uh, the, the set point, uh, the sensitivity for this metabolite dropped down to here, and then, it, of course, it crept back up. But by normalizing the data to the internal standard, uh, we, which also tracked in a similar fashion, we essentially flattened this line back out again. So the coefficient of variation over that four-week period for this particular endogenous metabolite in the pool plasma samples is reduced to 3.1%. So that's how we use a combination of pool plasma samples for checking quality of data using a, essentially a real sample, um, and then we can use the internal standards to normalize that signal away. So I'll stop there, and to conclude, um, <clears throat> we, I, I hope I made the point that metabolites have a broad range of physical characteristics and a broad coverage of the metabolome using LCMS at least requires multiple methods. The dynamic range of a typical LCMS instrument spans four orders of the magnitude, which is fantastic, uh, but the um, coverage of metabolites really depends on the amount of sample available and the specific workup uh, that one does. We have multiple instrument options available for doing LCMS. Triple quads are typically used for targeted analyses, and high-resolution instruments like QTOS and orbit traps can be used for non-targeted profiling. But one of the consequences uh, of, of this, these, this um, uh, set of options is that uh, as you go look from lab to lab, uh, they'll be equipped with different types of instrumentation, and because of that, methods are generally not standardized across labs. Um, the use of internal standards and in reference samples is very important for assessing quality and normalizing data in larger studies. And finally, I just conclude with this point that methods and capabilities continue to evolve with the development of new technologies. So the methods that we're running today may not be the methods that we are running in two years because in two years, uh, the instrument manufacturers uh, on, upon whom we depend uh, significantly for the technology um, may have developed new instruments that can really open up uh, new doors for uh, analyses. And with that, I'd, I'd like to stop, and, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Clary. It, it's now time for the question and answer session. So if you haven't yet submitted a question, now is the time to do so by clicking on the answer a question, ask a question box at the right side of your screen. Let's go ahead and see what questions have come in so far. Uh, how can we determine how much biomass is necessary to fall within the limit of sensitivity since sometimes the amount of sample for extraction of metabolites cannot be controlled by us? Uh, how can we know whether we have lost some metabolites that are under the limit of detection? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so our, our approach is usually to do a, a, a pilot extraction. So in the case where the sample is very precious, um, and I hope I'm answering this fully, but uh, we might start out with maybe the most dilute um, ext extraction um, scenario possible so that when we inject a small portion as a pilot, we're not consuming much of much of the sample. If you don't see what you're looking for there, then you can always uh, concentrate the sample down and then see if you can get it back into range. I hope that answers the question. All right. Uh, is the method for bacterial cultures similar to that used for biological sample extraction? Um, it's There are different variations on that. So uh, one of the, the chief... Um, to say simply yes, you could use the same procedure that we might use for cell culture, um, say a suspension culture, uh, for a suspension culture of bacteria. Uh, essentially, what one might do there is, you know, spin the pellets down, and then uh, may you may or may not wash the pellet, and then do a, a direct extraction. However. <clears throat> 
uh, one of the um, risks uh, with that type of procedure that's been documented uh, by others has been that the process of spinning the samples down uh, can induce um, some metabolic changes, some measurable metabolic changes. It's not something that we've measured specifically in our lab, but again, just from what I've read in the literature. Now, uh, so uh, others have proposed using methods of growing um, bacterial culture on filter paper uh, supports and then essentially lifting the paper off and extracting it from there. But it probably really depends on the system that you're working with in particular. In some cases, it's just not possible to grow the bacteria on filter paper, so we do use essentially the same procedures that we use for suspension cell culture, for example. All right. Another one here is, if a sample is from a cell culture, what might be some of the effects of medium on the metabolites? Uh, well, yeah, it, it, uh, pretty significant. So if, it's a, um, if you're growing in culture and, uh, for example, one effect could be that uh, there's a media component that's essential for the growth of the cells. And if, you, you know, if the media are not changed frequently, one might have... Uh, you know, essentially use up um, that particular uh, component of the media that would then um, essentially start, you know, subsequent to that point in time, the cells are starved of it, and that will affect the metabolic profiles. On the other hand, you could also influence metabolism by having excessive amounts of a particular component and drive certain types of pathways. Uh, so the, the media components really can impact the um, biochemistry of the cell. And then the other thing is just um, the one thing that we've found is uh, there, there are certain media that obviously a lot of the medias that are used are fairly rich in a lot of the me metabolites that we're actually trying to, to measure in intracellular um, in the cell extracts. And if those media, if the media aren't removed well from the cells, it can impose quite a, a background. Um, so you're essentially measuring, you know, the intracellular metabolites that you're interested in, as well as the metabolites that were in the residual media um, in the sample. So uh, we we tend to do a, a wash to remove the media um, to to, min to mitigate that that problem. Uh, you know. It, caveat that I mentioned before, again, is that if you, you know, add washing steps and so forth, there is a risk for certain cell types that you can impact the, the metabolism, you know, through, through those steps. But you kind of have to find a balance between um, uh, being able to make an accurate measure of the intracellular components versus, um, you know, actually uh, sort of essentially inducing some type of biological disruption through, through your workout. All right. Uh, another one here is says you said that you tend to use protein precipitation methods for processing samples in batches. What metabolites are not stable under those conditions and and couldn't be measured? Uh, uh, yeah, so under the so uh, metabolites that don't hold up well in the workflow that I've illustrated really are uh, things like. Um, uh, uh, nucleate uh, triphosphates like ATP, uh, GTP, and so on. Uh, what we've seen is that um, our, our, our procedures for uh, extracting the metabolites and then the time that it takes to, to work them up and then have them sit on the autosampler while they're waiting to be analyzed, we can actually um, witness or measure the, de the decay of, of, of compounds like that. What we've done is, um, well, we used to target those metabolites in our targeted methods. At this point, we've just removed them, even though we can measure them well as a as a um, sort of an intact synthetic compound. But because they're not stable to the workup, we just uh, remove them from the analysis because the data aren't reliable. All right. Uh, another question here: Is an internal standard always necessary? Uh, <laughs> I like we like to have the internal standard because it's you know we when we add an internal standard we know exactly how much we've added and since we add it in a protein precipitation type of sample preparation if we use one batch of solvent to do all the precipitations the uh, concentration of that internal standard is constant in all samples and theoretically should have a, a flat response so it's a reliable. Uh, signal that we can monitor to mo uh, to evaluate instrument uh, performance. Um, I think 
you know, uh, others, uh, you know, uh, might suggest that you could not use the internal standard. Uh, you know, you don't have to use an internal standard uh, for, say, normalization because you can use something called total signal normalization, where you essentially integrate all of, all of the signal that you've measured in in your run and um, uh, essentially normalize the data so that the uh, scale the data so that such that those totals are equal across all batches. And I think that's one of the rationales people use for um, not using internal standards. But <clears throat> for you know for our methods where you're doing a simple uh, protein precipitation for the most part and adding an organic solvent, it's it's actually you know it's. It, it, we find it's advantageous to add the internal standard. Again, we don't add an internal standard for every single metabolite, so it's not representative of how all metabolites might be, might be um, responding to changes in uh, the column uh, that might occur over time and so on. But it, it is something that, that we can use as at least one element of our quality control, um, as one element in our quality control assessment. So that's why why we use them. All right. Another question here is, what are the major bottlenecks in the LCMS workflow that you described? Oh. Well, um, so the two major bottlenecks are the time it takes to do the LCMS analyses, but actually the data processing is actually a pretty significant undertaking. So when we do the, run our targeted methods, we actually use software that it allows us to inspect, inspect the peak integrations for each, the, the, the integrals, I should say, for each of the metabolite peaks. So we had developed a process of uh, quickly, but it, uh, it's time consuming, quickly going through and looking at the integrated peak areas or the, the integration for every single component in each sample. And because the peak integration software, while it's pretty decent, is generally not perfect. And I'd say that's probably true for any you know algorithm or manufacturer. So we, we have found that it has paid to uh, manually inspect the integrated data and then reintegrate as necessary. So that, that actually adds a bottleneck um, to, to the workflow. So I think the runtime still are the, the, the greatest uh, component um, in terms of it, it's the major bottleneck, but data processing and review is, you know, approaches that. And th I think it's time well spent, uh, even though it's fairly expensive in terms of time. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, this looks like a good one, actually. What recommendations could you give for the process of selecting an internal standard for a non-targeted profiling experiment? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, so first of all, you'd want an internal standard that is um, uh, essentially representative of the types of metabolites that you're measuring with your um, with that particular chromatography method. So, for example, if you're looking at lipids, if it's a method that, you know, is designed to really separate lipids and your internal standard should be a, you know, component that has characteristics similar to a lipid. You should also have one that has, um, uh, that ionizes using the same types of, uh, forms the same type of ion as the components generally of interest. So if you're doing positive ion mode method and it's mostly M plus H, you should use an internal standard that ionizes the same way as opposed to a compound that's neutral and needs to pick up a, an ammonium ion to form a, uh, an ion addict and, uh, you know, for measurement. So those would be the two things I would say right off the bat. And then, then the question is really, uh, you know, do you really need to use a, a, a stable isotope labeled synthetic reference standard, or can you use a non-biological um, standard? Um, and then I think that there you really want to, um, I would evaluate them based on the cost and um, uh, the purity of the standard and, and how well they go into solution and how stable they are once put in solution. So if you make a large batch of extraction solvent that you want to use for, say, a period of a month, you'd like to have that internal standard be um, stable in solution. So those are, I would, you know, think about those practical considerations. Um, that, that, the, and those would influence my choice. Uh, first, and again, it should have similar physical properties to the types of metabolites that are being measured with that particular method. But I think it doesn't necessarily have to be biological, and it doesn't have to be stable isotope labeled. All right, we're just about out of time, and so need to conclude the Q and A session.
Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available for viewing in the next few days. We will send each of you an email with details of how to access the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides and instructions on how to customize and print a certificate of attendance. You can also access the slides and the certificate of attendance right now from the Docs and Links tab at the right side of your screen. So this concludes today's webinar, and we look forward to your attendance at future events from Current Protocols. On behalf of our speaker, Clary Klisch, and from me, Gwen Taylor, and our sponsor, Thermo Scientific, we hope you've learned some valuable information, and it's goodbye for now. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you.